my first brush with archives was as a comparative literature major in college. And I was working on a junior paper on classical Chinese poetry and thinking about my senior thesis. And I found that there in the library catalog, there was um, a collection of Ezra Pound's translations of poetry, Chinese poetry, um, and um, a collection of his papers in the manuscripts library. But you needed to call and make an appointment to view the collection sometime during the hours of 10 and 4 p.m. And as a student who had a campus job after class, it just, it seemed too much trouble. I wasn't sure what to expect, what um, was really required to be able to view this collection. And so ultimately um, my research took a different direction, but um, what my goal is today uh, for this workshop is to equip you to feel comfortable and confident to um, really undertake this process of digging into archives and um, to, to recognize that it is a process um, and um, one that will be of value to you. So my goal, um, the agenda for today is to actually give you a little bit of context. Um, one second. So first to start with um, some background on how archives come to be, um, then to talk about uh, where to look and what to, expand, what to find and what to expect to find in archives by looking at a specific example. And hopefully that will give you some strategies uh, for methods and approaches to your own research. Why is this important? Well, I actually want to um, recall a slide from Professor Lugin's first presentation, um, setting, in setting the stage in the, in the first session of this workshop series. This slide captured three important points that knowledge is grounded in context. Um, and, and indeed, archives research is all about context. Um, the knower is not an abstract individual and um, archives actually are created by individuals, organizations, by communities. And so understanding um, that there are materials generated, um, again, this is important for um, the sources of our knowledge. And then thirdly, that um, Location. So again, location provides an opening for developing knowledge about how the wor world uh, works. And in the same way, location is actually really key in terms of approaches to archives research. The fact that we talk about finding aids um, when we approach archives uh, gives you a sense of why location and understanding the viewpoint within a collection is, is key. So I also want to share a quote that um, a friend of mine also captured. Um, Knowledge is of two kinds. You can know a subject or know where to find information about it. And that's, that's key. You can, <laughs> it's, yes, it's important that we know about um, our subjects of expertise, but even more importantly, to know connections um, for, further knowledge for how to find out more. Um, so I think one thing I want to share too is that um, even though it's been about 20 years since I was a student um, in college and we've seen a sea change in terms of how information is accessed, unfortunately the reality of access to primary sources from and about this region is not too different from the experience I had as a student, um, especially when we're talking about online access, which is so key to all of us um, today in this and under these cir circumstances, right? Um, we rely on digital access to information. I've, I've um, called in some instances, um, this region an information desert because um, when you look online at um, 
you know, public sources like Wikipedia, you don't actually find a great deal of depth um, in terms of the information about Merced. Um, you know, so this, this is um, snippets from the Wikipedia entry for Merced, California. And under history, it's basically about a hundred words. Um, and we know that there's a lot more to this history, um, but this is, this is exactly why I think this, this Loose Foundation, this initiative is so important because just as when we talk about food deserts uh, needing, you know, requiring different ways of sourcing and um, distributing fresh food, um, in the same way, this project of engaging um, graduate students in community research to generate new knowledge is so key for really um, broadening the access to knowledge of and about the San Joaquin Valley in this region. I'm gonna dive in and give you a little bit of, of uh, background now. And I think this will help to give you context when shaping your approach to archives research. So I will start by talking a little bit about how archives come to be um, and where to look for them. So just as an archeologist looks for material evidence of human activity uh, at an excavation site, archives provide a documentary record of human activity. So the difference is that um, with archives, there's this deliberate action of collecting, of saving and making available ultimately um, the records, the documentary evidence that we're talking about. And okay, so the term archives, um, you know, comes from the ancient Greek and it, is related to this idea of office or rule. So when we think about some of the earliest documentary evidence that we have, um, they are typically or often records related to public office of some kind of um, laws, for example, of contracts, of transactions, of important decisions that were made. Uh, the, and you know, in our histories, there's certainly, um, you can see the significance of archives and the consequence of keeping these records in different cultural histories. For example, in the, in the, in the Jewish story behind um, Purim, for example, the, the people face threat of genocide and, um, the king of Persia um, has a, a sleepless night and consults the archives to find that um, the, a Jewish man actually had done something to save the king's life. So, you know, we have, we have in our lore, in our tradition, stories of how archives and records have been key to changing um, the course of history. And in the, in the United States, in this country, we can actually trace archives to um, two different traditions or paradigms. One is what is frequently called the manuscripts tradition or model. And then the second is the public records uh, paradigm or tradition. And um, so early on, in the history of this country, there were individuals, um, private collectors who believed it was important to preserve the records of the founding of this um, new democracy. And so in 1791, they formed a historical society. And many of the records of our um, early founders, including three presidents, John Adams, um, John Quincy Adams, and Thomas Jefferson, those but their papers are actually, um, they were deposited in this repository, which is now um, the Massachusetts Historical Society. So um, in this um, 
this tradition of um, historical societies of um, private collectors who have kept their papers or family records, typically these collections are arranged more like library collections. Um, they may be organized and classified um, by subject matter or by chronology. Um, and, um, and so uh, you can see that these, these uh, ways of treating these collections actually have, they have been passed on kind of through um, this, this line of tradition. But in the um, mid 19th century and after the Civil War as um, the federal government grew in size and as the discipline of history actually became um, an emerging discipline within the academy, within universities, there was this broader recognition of the need for a national archives to be established. And there were other milestones that kind of contributed to this movement. Um, there was the founding of the American Historical Association that ultimately led to um, camp, you know, campaigns for the establishment of the National Archives, the National Historical Publications Commission. Um, and um, that was ultimately signed into existence by um, FDR in 1934. And the way that National Archives was, were, um, was conceived was actually also influenced by European um, notions of archives as public records and in particular um, approaches taken at um, the French National Archives, for example, which uh, really emphasized the origin, the originating office of records. So the term provenance and also respect de fonds, which is um, again, underscoring the importance of how these records work and, and by whom they were created within an office um, is something that has then shaped how um, public records have been kept and maintained. And so, um, we, we talk about original order too as being important. Um, and this relates to key values such as keeping the authenticity and the natural way that records were kept in order to preserve the interrelationships of that, of, um, that set of records within the office. Um, you know, keeping that as, as context for later uh, researchers or uh, later use. So this is kind of similar to how um, it's important to kind of keep the context of evidence within, for example, an archeological dig, right? So um, knowing this, um, this kind of tradition and knowing that these were um, the key underlying principles will give you insight into why archives are maintained the way that they are and why as a researcher, when you're actually going into archives today, you'll be asked to stick closely to um, important practices like maintaining the order of files within a box or the order of items within a folder. So, the records of the federal government um, and so and uh, all of its agencies today can be uncovered um, in the National Archives, right? So the National Archives also includes presidential libraries. Um, the scope is approximately 10 billion pages today of, of records. Um, but it's also important to note that the the archives, the National Archives keeps only about two to 5% of the records generated by federal, by federal agencies today. And so um, there is this key concept of um, appraisal of how to determine what to keep. And I also want to just also, you know, just 
underscore that this the public records exist officially at many different levels, right? So there's uh, the state archives, each state uh, similarly maintains um, agency archives, uh, records of the governor's office, um, state media, uh, and um, at the county level, certainly you can also see that there are some items kept um, within the county uh, office, you know, there's an archive center, but uh, when you look at this, uh, if you go into the site, it, the history of what is online, the scope of what is online is actually very limited. Um, but again, I, I think it's important to keep in mind that within this tradition, there is this um, view of records having different stages of use and at some point they uh, there's a decision of whether they will be disposed of or whether they will go um, into a repository for permanent keeping. And so um, we, we talk about a records retention schedule um, and this is often, um, you know, you can find uh, documentation about this for, um, you know, the state, for the national level, for the university, um, in terms of what what policies are in place for what is kept and for how long. Okay. But as I mentioned, there's also you know much more that's generated even um, than can be kept uh, if you were to follow the records retention schedule. Uh, so uh, there are steps that archivists take to appraise um, and determine the value. And so this involves um, concepts of, again, what's, what's, uh, what has enduring value. So what evidence uh, is important to keep, um, considerations of the information value of records. Um, and so factors that come into play here, you know, include if, if you have a stash of records, but there, you know, photographs that there's very little descriptive information, very little identifying information. Unfortunately, that's going to be a very little informational value. Um, you know, so um, it's, it would be very costly and possibly you know, it may not even be um, likely to uncover enough information to make keeping these records, um, you know, of value. So, so the circumstances of creation also become a factor, um, whether there uh, were records created by private individuals and there was an expectation of confidentiality or whether the records were created by a public office and also practical issues around the cost of keeping um, and storing these records. So, in addition to, um, you know, the state, the national state, county level, um, you know, government records in archives, uh, we can see that there are also universities that keep archives and uh, corporations that keep archives, uh, organizations that keep archives. So how do you uncover those? Well, um, you can, you know, the Society of American Archivists actually keeps a directory of corporate um, archives. Um, so some companies or associations will uh, post information about access to their archives. Um, but some businesses or corporations, um, often their archives are maintained by a marketing or a public relations department. So that's um, important to know that that kind of shapes the records that are kept. Um, within the university, there's both the records of the founding of the university, of the offices and uh, divisions, 
you know, that follow again, kind of this um, structure, but there are also, it, um, you know, there, there are policies around what the university keeps typically uh, because they are collections that are key to the research or um, key to, um, you know, the history of the community, the surrounding region um, where the university is. So um, I, I also just want to bring up that when you look at the County Historical Society, you can see they have a very different uh, assortment of collections. And um, it's typical that within historical societies, these collections are again, they may have followed more of that um, personal papers manuscripts tradition. So um, they, but when you go to the Merced County Historical Society, um, the site, um, there's, there's a listing of these collections. You will have to actually uh, make an appointment to see and um, really dig into what these collections hold. Now I'm going to dive into also um, at, at uh, this, across the state, this resource um, the Online Archive of California is a database of guides to archival collections um, held by libraries, including all of the UC campuses, uh, but also public libraries, cultural institutions like historical societies and museums, and even um, state and, um, you know, even like the national park, some of them are beginning to um, deposit or keep records of their collections in uh, the OAC. So this is another important resource to look at. And I'm, I want to, in this section, then dive into um, specifically what's available at UC Merced and into a, um, a collection to hopefully give you some insight into how to approach research within a collection. So at UC Merced, uh, when you look up uh, our institution on the OAC, you'll see that there are three main groupings or three main repositories. Um, there's the library and special collections, which includes university archives and faculty papers, as well as some local collections that we have um, acquired. There is the physical planning design and construction archives, which are records of the um, design and construction of campus that are managed by uh, that office under uh, facilities management and administration. And then thirdly, there's the UC Cooperative Extension Archive which was established uh, under an agreement with the UC Division of Ag and Natural Resources. So I'm going to dive into this, uh, this third collection um, to discuss how to navigate and understand the structure of um, a repositories collection and how it's curated. Um, so hopefully that will give you a more insight into what to expect when you're conducting research. Um, there are currently 12 collections under the UC Cooperative Extension Archive and they represent records from 14 counties. And as you'll see in the OAC collection guides, these, these are what are listed here. Um, they follow a standard format, but uh, they vary uh, in terms of level of detail. And that variance really reflects the level of processing that has been performed on a collection. So within the UC Cooperative Extension Archive, you'll see that there are some that are quite brief in terms of the record description and it may include an inventory, um, but there are others like the Merced County collection that are much more detailed because they have been processed at a greater level. 
Um, so when you go into the Merced County Cooperative Extension Finding Aid, um, at, the, at the first uh, page of this finding aid, you'll see the description that provides a general overview of the scope and subject matter and date span of the collection. And then background, which gives you some context uh, behind the individual or the organization that um, you know, created or where these records originated um, and the circumstances of their creation. So for the UC Cooperative Extension Archives, um, you know, this, they trace their origin to UC Cooperative Extension um, was established um, when, um, first of all, when uh, Teddy Roosevelt had commissioned this report on the um, status of rural life in America. And this uh, rural life commission, um, one of their recommendations for improving quality of life in rural America was to establish this extension service um, that where the land grant universities established in the um, late 1800s, right, would be able to deliberately partner with the local community to uh, extend their outreach and educate um, rural Americans about better practices for agriculture and um, around technology. And, and so, um, oops, oh dear. It led to, this commission led to the passage of the Smith-Lever Act, um, which established the extension service. And um, so cooperative extension has existed in counties since um, 1914, 1915, you know, that, that time span when um, counties established a farm bureau that would partner with the University of California um, to, to um, perform this kind of um, outreach and um, programming. So cooperative extension required organization at the county level. And so you can see when we, how these records came to be actually was in a um, hundred years later when cooperative extension celebrated its anniversary, um, the offices around the state um, were looking for records to celebrate the history. And they realized that there had not been a deliberate effort to save and um, preserve an archive. Um, they, the county offices had been keeping records, but there was not really an effort to um, deliberately maintain. And so uh, they approached UC Merced and um, the agreement was in place for UC Merced and the library to work with um, the Division of Ag and Natural Resources to county by county then um, assess what records were there and um, to create this archive. Um, so this is kind of, unfortunately, this is, has been, um, this may be the case for some of these organizations that you're talking about where um, they have kept records, but there may not have been a deliberate effort to organize and maintain. So um, with Merced County, uh, we uncovered about 300 linear feet of records within the office. And um, the archives, uh, the library un undertook a survey of all of these records to then identify what was important to keep. And in doing so, we also um, conducted interviews with uh, the advisors and key, key folks within these offices to see what they referenced and what was important to them. And um, 
these were then brought to the library to be organized, to be processed, and to be digitized. So I want to go back to the guide. Um, what you'll see is, like I mentioned, on the, you know, on the front page, there's a description, but on the, on the right hand side, there is a more specific listing of the contents of the collection. And um, that reflects the arrangement of the, or the structure of the records. And if you click on the uh, link at the top, you can actually then see a full finding aid. This is the detailed finding aid of the arrangement and um, the files that you find. And this follows what we call a um, this hierarchy of the record groups, the series, the files and items. Um, so that's important to keep in mind. So again, so when you drill down, you'll see this listing of the series and um, groupings um, that this collection has been organized into. Okay. So at the top, there's also a link to digital items and that takes you to where uh, this collection is represented in Calisphere. Um, the digitized items belong on, uh, they, they can be found on this larger uh, aggregation site called Calisphere, which is also part of the California Digital Library. Um, so what I'm going to look at um, now is the Okay, so, <laughs> so this this record grouping, the first, um, so you can see the first series actually was the administrative files. Um, that, and when I drill down here in the finding aid, you'll see that these are broken down into the subseries of um, reports. So you, you see annual and weekly reports, which are, um, that go back to the start of the office uh, in Merced. And the county agent is um, basically the director of the office, the person who was assigned um, to establish uh, the extension office in the county. Um, so I'm going into Calisphere and I, I, what I was curious is, and I want to you know, kind of walk you through is, what can we learn about the, the history of Merced from these records, right? So what can, what, what perspectives do these um, county agent reports provide? And so um, the office was established in 1916 in Merced, um, but the earliest reports date to 1918, 1919. And um, so I, as you can see here, you, you, um, in Calisphere, I see the whole group of county agent reports, um, but I uh, pulled out um, the narrative reports. And um, the narrative reports are more descriptive um, than the, the, form, the very more formal and um, uh, more, uh, tabular reports that were created by the county agents. So in my mind, 1918-1919, uh, um, the marker is, that's of course the uh, First World War, um, but I think many of us, our perspective is colored too by the current situation. And I was curious to know, is there any mention of the 
1918 uh, Spanish flu, the flu uh, pandemic and these records. Um, so I pulled the reports to see and what you see is that there's a description of um, Merced as virgin territory for rural organization work. Um, so this is kind of the perspective of the agent viewing how is he going to start the work of establishing um, programs and projects and collaborations with uh, farmers in this area. Um, I went through the report and there is no mention of the flu or the pandemic. What you see is, um, you know, for example, there's discussion of efforts to improve the conditions of the land. Um, there's description of the conditions of the soil. There is mention of this jackrabbit um, control uh, action that was taken, this campaign. And if you go back a little bit, um, in, you'll see 1917, 1918 was when there's um, this effort to eliminate jackrabbits in the county. Um, and then I see pages that describe various settlements or communities. And this is really interesting because there are place names here that are not, that don't, um, are not as familiar today, right? Um, but you can see from the perspective of the agent, um, what they see as the current conditions of the community, the land, prospects for organization. I also um, delved into the narrative reports of the uh, home demonstration agent who was um, staff who was also working alongside the county agent to work with um, homemakers or the, to improve the quality of domestic life in the region at that time. So the first narrative report by a home demonstration agent that's available for Merced is 1920. Um, again, going through that report, uh, there's no real mention, there's no mention at all of the pandemic, but you do see descriptions of efforts to improve the health and nutrition of children in the communities. So um, it's interesting to see a mention of the start of um, school lunches, hot school lunches, and this picture of um, school children, which is actually, if you look at the pictures, it you know, reflects different ethnic groups uh, within the picture. And this is pointed out by this home demonstration agent, every nationality in a child feeding demonstration. Okay, so the, the next marker then in my mind is um, 1929, 1930, a decade later, I was curious to see if there is what's recorded in terms of the impact of the stock market crash and the, and the start of the, the depression, right? So I pulled um, the report of the agent from 1929, 1930. And um, what you see is this discussion of new settlers in the region. Um, Merced County has continued to attract you know, new settlers located on land recently owned by Miller and Lux. Um, you can also see discussion of the older groups of settlers that have been um, moving out. Um, there's also mention of a second successive dry year, which um, may suggest, you know, again, that's kind of um, precursor to some of the conditions in the, in the 1930s. Um, no direct mention though of um, economic impacts yet of, of the crash, you know, that's in our mind in, in, in 1929. Um, and when you look at the reports from the home demonstration agent, uh, again, there's not really obvious mentions of the effects 
uh, you can see when I pulled the report, there's an interesting discussion of um, these studies of um, time spent on homemaking activities, uh, whether the introduction of um, electric washers has actually improved uh, how much time homemakers spend on, on laundry. Um, and so it kind of points to their focus for um, improving quality of life in homes in that time period. So I also see though in, so I looked in the subsequent year's report to see if there were any um, discussions. Um, no, uh, not really. Uh, there's, but there's an interesting statement of, uh, there's a record of work that the home demonstration agent did in the Cortez Belico area uh, with Japanese families uh, introducing cooking, uh, American ways of preparing food and the interest there. So that was kind of interesting in terms of the cultural connections. Um, so that then points to kind of my, my next marker, which is the following decade and the war and whether or not there's record of um, the impact of um, the effort to in turn incarcerate uh, Japanese Japanese American families in the region, if there's any discussion of that in, in these materials. And I pulled out um, the report from 1941-1942 for that year of, of the county agent. And there's discussion, you can see here, there's an outline of their work. Um, certainly you can see the impact of the war on the projects that they undertook. Um, you can also, but there was no mention in this 41-42 report at all of, of that event and um, the real you know, uh, actions that occurred in this area at that time. And I looked at the subsequent year's report and there is a section on farm labor. There's a discussion of the impact on shortages of workers um, as a result of the war. Um, there's, you know, this is interesting as I was reading this is that there's then mention of um, the initiatives undertaken to address the labor shortage and specifically um, bringing in Mexican nationals. So we know now, you know, that's that was the you know, the Braceros, um, that's not the term that was used in this report, right? But, um, and you see then on the following page um, that there is, you know, this, as a result of the shortage, there's also lack of adequate housing. So there's mention of cabins then being built from the barracks, which were located on the county fairgrounds that were used to house the Japanese Americans that were incarcerated there. So that is actually the only mention within this, within the reports that I could find of um, this um, key event. So, you know, what follows that is then discussion of crops, um, there's a section here that talks about the introduction of tests for um, use of commercial fertilizers and the amounts that were applied to see the uh, effects of, you know, these, commercial, these new commercial fertilizers on production of, of food. So I'll just also say that I, I picked up on this DD and I was wondering if DD refers to DD, um, DDT, but it's, it's, not, it's not that uh, the same uh, compound. But um, what I wanted to show or uh, discuss here is that um, 
from diving into these, these reports, um, what we often have is we have these markers in, in our minds in terms of what is important, um, right? So I, I had a certain framework of what to look for um, and I was curious about what I would find. And there, that's kind of the adjustment that has to happen is that we have our own key milestones or key names and events, and they may not be what you actually find in archival documents. So um, what you, what I, uh, what we did uncover though, is what, and what's important to see is then um, the, the terminology and patterns um, that you see within the archives themselves, right? So um, with the reports, there are formal patterns of what is discussed. There's kind of a structure to these records um, and um, topics that are um, discussed from year to year. And also, you know, terms like instead of braceros, right, Mexican nationals that you have to pick up on within these documents that reflect how the creator um, discussed or the creator conceived of um, those um, events and activities, right? Um, so that's really important is that we have to adjust our own framing, right? To then we have to be open to uncovering the framing within these collections. Um, so, you know, stepping back, I can, I can then consider, so what questions can be asked of this collection, right? Um, from the reports, you find the discussion, you can see that there is this record of the various settlements within the region, within the county. Um, there are maps that identify where um, the uh, Farm Bureau members, where the community organizations um, that were formed, um, where they were located. And you can trace that through the reports. You can trace um, the, you know, the agent in the, in the tabular reports will record how many farms were there, how many um, visits to homes were undertaken. And from that, you can kind of extrapolate changes in the population um, and his discussion of the outlook for projects, you know, uh, includes um, the receptiveness of people at the time to certain initiatives. Um, the local, the, the physical conditions, like the conditions of the soil or the water uh, situation. Um, and as we saw too, you know, there's a lot of discussion of labor and how that changes um, in the region and ownership of farms and tenancy. So those are things, those are, you know, as you, as you go through, you can see, okay, these are reasonable questions that can then be asked of, of this collection. Um, and then to draw the connections, you know, the, from that information, um, you can draw connections between physical condition, location, human intervention. So what projects, what work happened, um, what campaigns for health, um, um, public health, uh, improvement, um, how did that uh, change the situation within the county? And then um, going out further, so keeping in mind that this collection resides among other county collections, right? So um, besides Merced, there are um, these 14 other counties represented within this archive. So you can then, you know, look at, at that aggregate level for records and for trends. And the benefit of this uh, online archive of the digitized items is that you can sort, you know, by chronology, you can sort 
and search to see um, when crops began to be introduced into um, the state, into different regions, the, um, the trials and um, when commercial fertilizer and um, you know, the labor trends at the, at the uh, regional and um, statewide level. Um, this concept of community development, of working with um, different populations, you can also find and, and conduct research then at that level um, where you, know, you can see documents of different um, uh, you know, Southeast Asian community, um, you can see that reflected in the changes of, in the records. So um, that's the benefit of this digital, you know, repository. Uh, there are some, I think, some limitations to point out is that in Calisphere, um, you can do search uh, against the descriptive metadata, you cannot do full text searching within Calisphere. So um, what you'll need to do then is, and what we have been looking at doing is providing the text uh, for download uh, at a bulk level. And um, that will ena enable you to use uh, other tools to kind of, to explore trends within the collection. So for example, text analysis at that aggregate level, you can see key topics and um, ad adjacencies you know, within the, the bulk of these records. And so this is an example of what we've been experimenting with um, record, you know, the reports from one county we've been looking at analyzing the combined um, digital text of those records to see what are the trends and what can we do with these text analysis tools. So I showed you, you know, that, that kind of walk through those samples of the reports from the Cooperative Extension Archives. Um, you know, it, it's easier to be able to sort and view items when they're available online, but those were, if you were to go into uh, the physical archives, it takes time to pull out the, you know, the boxes to identify the placement of the records within the collection. And um, there is, you know, there, there may be different um, places within a collection that items are located in. So the county agent reports were in one box, the home demonstration agent reports are in another box in another subseries. So it takes time for um, those items, the physical items to be um, pulled. Uh, I also want to encourage you to look at other major uh, databases uh, or, or places where you can look for what's available. Um, Archive Grid is one way of searching for archives that are, are available. Um, the Digital Public Library of America is a, a national level aggregation of digital collections from libraries and other cultural uh, institutions. So again, uh, you can see a large, large, large uh, collection of online materials and Sometimes you'll find um, that collections may end up in different places because they are a reflection of those different relationships, right? Of, um, you know, when there's correspondence, there's both the creator and the receiver. So uh, they may end up in different locations. Uh, I was also just encourage you to look for specific um, funding opportunities to support your research some institutions and uh, libraries actually have travel grants or uh, special collections research grants. Um, so uh, if you're interested in accessing a particular collection at, at some institutions, they may have um, funding available to cover and support you as a, as a graduate student. And lastly, um, 
there's a lot more information online. Um, there's a guide, a libguide. Uh, I, my colleague, Gerald Sharoma has uh, within this guide, um, he has compiled a list of regional uh, cultural institutions and repositories. Um, so that is a good starting point for those of you that may be interested in what else is available in the region. I would encourage you to reach out to us, um, Gerald and Rebecca Gurevich, who I believe is on this, um, this call. She is uh, the project archivist for the California Agricultural Resources Archive, which includes the cooperative extension record. So um, if you want to learn more about those collections, reach out to her. And of course you can reach out to the library um, by email at any time or you know, by our various channels.